Um, I will speak in English, okay? Very slowly, not very sophisticated. First of all, I apologize for being late. Uh, and second, uh, I I am very grateful to the Kidma uh, for bringing us together tonight. Kidma is doing uh, a very good job in introducing Israel to non-Jews and Jew Hungarian Jews, which is very important uh, nowadays. Uh, we need all the help we can get. We, I mean, State of Israel, in order to. Um, be more uh, confirmed in our positions vis-a-vis -vis those outside who do not recognize the legitimacy of uh, the basic existence of Israel. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, in this regard, Hungary as a state is um, an island in a storm, an island in the ocean, because the trends in West Europe nowadays vis-a-vis -vis Israel are not that positive. If you take the relations between Israel and the European Union, which Hungary is a friend, you will not be happy to see how tense the relations are. <coughs> Luckily, among the group of 28 countries of the European Union, Hungary and some Central European countries are considered to be nowadays more friendly, relatively friendlier to Israel than other countries, which is good by itself. Now, when we talk about uh, the basic existence of Israel and the attempt to make Israel or portray Israel as illegitimate, to compare Israel with apartheid. We pay tribute to Nelson Mandela last week. Israel vis-a-vis -vis apartheid. The Yom Kippur War is, according to my opinion, part of <coughs> this attempt by the Arab world to create a situation in which Israel either exists or not. Since the very beginning, and I don't have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the history of Israel since 1947, well, you go back to 1929, 1935, and then the independence war in 1948, and ever since, until today, there's been attempts to destroy, literally destroy Israel. Now, I was, uh, I do remember the 67 uh, uh, war, the June, the Six Day War in 1967. I was 12 or 13 years old. I was walking from home to school. It was Monday. And suddenly I heard uh, the news on the radio. I don't know if you remember the days before the Six Day War, the many, many days and weeks and some months of waiting and what this happened, uh, what this caused the Israeli society in 67. Because you remember uh, Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, he always uh, declared and threatened that he will destroy the state of Israel. The Egyptian army will bur burn Tel Aviv and the psychic of the Israeli society at that time, as I told you, I was young, I don't remember a lot. But the psychic was that there's going to be another Shoah. They will destroy us. And this was 67, not very far, long, uh, not a long time ago from 1956, in this uh, Suez operation or Sinai operation. And uh, fear for total extermination of the state of Israel was imminent, was very, you know, people dig the trenches in public gardens, in public parts, parks, and the rabbis took or, or put special places for mass graves, and people were afraid. And then, 
came the wonderful victory of in six days uh, we overcome the mighty combination of uh, three armies, the Syrian, the Jordanian, and the Egyptians, and, uh, yeah. you know, Jordan. Jordanian, Syrian, and Egyptian armies, in six days we uh, overcome, we occupied uh, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and Gaza, Sinai. And then we were so happy. We were so, how shall I say, Happy is, is, is understatement. Uh, we were sure that from now on, nothing can happen to us. Israel is a strong, powerful country, small against the mighty, like David and Goliath. In the world, it was a miracle. The state of Israel, a small country, was the uh, sweet boy of all the people. I do remember how many volunteers, foreign volunteers, non-Jewish, came to Israel to participate, to work on kibbutzim, and to contribute to this magnificent miracle of Israel. We were, uh, you know, the, the headlines were positive, and Israel was the best or the most loved country in the world. And we were sure that that's it, there will be no more war, we will stay in the territories forever because this was, as the religious part of Israel says, it was a victory with God's help. And these are our territories because it was promised to us by God. It is in the Bible, etc., etc., etc. And then time passes on. 68, 1967, 1970, the attrition war on the Suez Canal many casualties on the Israeli side. But still, our politicians said, if they want to talk to us, if they, the, Arab, the Arabs, they know our numbers, number, their telephone number. The Hebrews, the show off, the, the feeling that nothing can harm Israel was controlling the psychic of the Israeli society. And generals were the heroes of our society to walk into a restaurant with uniform, with your ranks here, free lunches. <laughs> you know, the soldiers were treated like they were second to God. No, I'm telling you this because, to my basic, humble, personal opinion, the roots of the tragedy of the Yom Kippur War is to be seen immediately after the great victory, military, victory of Israel on, uh, in the Six-Day War. And it is there because we were blind, most of us. There were people who were not blind. Some philosophers, some politicians said, well, this is the time to show generosity. In German it is called, do you understand German? Gnade der Sieger the merciness of the, the one who won. Not to destroy everything, but to reach out and try to come in a, to, an exist, to, to an agreement which will stop the conflict. But most of us, most the politicians from all sides, they were in a way blind. We didn't see. We didn't see the roots of the next war. That's why we were concentrating in building our nation. The economy was flourishing, everything was good. But then started the occupation. Immediately after 67, it was an enlightenment or an occupation which was more humanistic than any other occupation. <coughs> you can understand that occupation and being human cannot coincide with each other. Occupation is occupation. And it's good, it's best for our, bad for us as much as it, it is bad for the other people. Long term, this is why we would like to end the occupation with an agreement today, more than 40 years. Because we know that at the end of the day, um, ruling other people is contrary to the Jewish nature of our country, to the democratic values of our country. But we cannot do it, uh, you know, as uh, waking up, uh, standing up and going one day to the other, 
without having security. So we were blind after 67, we were very happy. And we didn't see what is the consequences long term of ruling other people in the West Bank and in Gaza. Also in the Middle East, uh, changes have been happening. Uh, As uh, Nasser died and uh, Anwar Sadat came, came into power. <coughs> Who was I, uh, Anwar Sadat? Nobody knew. He was general. And he came into power and immediately, immediately in history, immediately, uh, of course, it's a question of a couple of years, he sent messages. There was the famous Roger, Rogers plan. Rogers was the Secretary of State, 1970, the war of attrition. The war of attrition caused Israel a lot of casualties on the Suez Canal. And then at that time, the Suez Canal was built as a fortress, this Balev conception of bunkers alongside with some networking between them. <coughs> it was stable, it was not as flexible as a defense system should be. And at that time was Moshe Dayan, the defense minister, who said at that time, it's better to have Sharm al-Sheikh without peace than to have peace without Sharm al-Sheikh. This was the embodiment, to my personal opinion, of the hubris feeling that we had. We are indefensible. And we will not give in for peace without Sharm al-Sheikh. It means the idea of greater Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea of greater Israel is a, is a legitimate idea and vision. There is no law in the world against <coughs> having dreams. There are people in Israel, many of them, including myself, who believe, really believe that if you take the Old Testament, you go and visit the places which you read in Israel, in the land of Israel, in the Holy Land, in Jerusalem, in the West Bank, in Judea, in Samaria. But then you have to be realistic enough and to think can you maintain three elements together? A, a Jewish state, a Jewish by character. B, a democratic state. And C, a big state, ge geographically. Can you coincide with these three elements? Because, to my opinion, you cannot. Because, and not, it's not only my opinion, it's the opinion of many people nowadays, because if you want to remain a Jewish and democratic, you, you cannot be big by size. And if you be, want to be big by size, you cannot remain Jewish and democratic. So you have to give up one of these three elements. And I think the governments of Israel since 1977, and I'm jumping from the war to 1977, which is part of it, since Menachem Begin, until today we have decided that in order to remain Jewish and democratic state, we have to give up this third factor, which is the geographical one, the size. So in order to have peace and to maintain our democratic <coughs> character, we are ready to make compromise regarding the territory. Well, we can make compromise by ourselves. What does it bring? It brings nothing. We have to have a partner. This is a topic for another lecture. Do we have a partner now? We had a partner with Anwar Sadat. Again, I'm jumping a little bit ahead. We had a partner with King Hussein. We gave territory and we received peace. Can we, can we uh, give territory, namely the West Bank, back and have peace? Big question mark. Big question mark. Because security and peace regarding the West Bank and Gaza are interrelated. But this is, as I said, a topic for another meeting, and I ask Kidma if you want to arrange it, I'm ready to come and to have a debate, because it is not black and white issue. Coming back to the Yom Kippur War, 
There were, there was, as I said, the political program by Rogers. Uh, William Rogers was a Secretary of State, uh, which was rejected by Golda Meir. And post factum, we know that this was a time, more or less, in which Anwar Sadat has decided that in order to get out of the political impasse in which Israel was, is on is on the Suez Canal, not very far from Egypt, and nothing is happening, and the humiliation of the Arab world is still there, in order to make or bring the political process, the peace process, into motion, he has to do something. And unfortunately, the only thing he could do, because all his send, uh, messages and programs were rejected by this hubris attitude, the only thing which came to mind is to have a military action, a military move. He never thought that he could bring Israel or defeat Israel on the battlefield. But he wanted to break the status quo, because the status quo in the Middle East, the status quo is like a vacuum. And in the Middle East, especially in the Middle East, a vacuum cannot stay empty for a long time. So in order to set the process in motion, he combined with Syria and the war started on the 6th of October at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 1400. I remember when I was there, I was 17, 17 and a half, uh, not in the army. I was supposed to be drafted in February 1974. <coughs> Then I had to go to my uh, family's business far from Tel Aviv, and it was Yom Kippur, mind you. And I remember driving with someone next to me from Tel Aviv to the north. The highway, the highway number, uh, number two from Tel Aviv to Haifa was empty. And we uh, turned on the radio, and we stopped for refueling, and then I heard it was uh, 14 two in the afternoon, two hour, uh, two and 10 minutes. And then I heard that uh, the hostility, hostilities uh, started on the Suez Canal and on the Golan Heights. I was not involved in the war, but I had a friend from uh, elementary school <coughs> who was drafted uh, earlier than me. And I knew that he was on the Golan Heights. And not uh, very few uh, days afterwards, I heard that he was uh, killed on the Golan Heights. Not only killed, he was murdered by the Syrian uh, soldiers. His body was, among others, was desecrated. I don't want to go into details. His name was David, so may God have mercy on his soul now. So I, not, I did not participate in the, in the war. I volunteered to work in one, at one of the hospitals. Uh, and I re do remember we treated also uh, some Egyptian uh, POWs, prisoners of wars, uh, who were uh, wounded at that time. And I remember that all the war um, I spent outside Tel Aviv, uh, maintaining an eye on my family's business. So, personally, this is the only memory I have, but I do remember the afterwards of the war, in which I immediately was drafted. I became a soldier on the November 7th, 1973, and I went to the Golani uh, Infantry, and I was sent together with others to the Golan Heights to uh, um, to help in the election campaign, which was uh, in October or December 1973, because Golda Meir called for very early election. And I saw the ruins on the Galan Heights, and I saw everything, and um, what, remember, what I remember vividly is the, the feeling among the Israeli society afterwards, how could it be? How could it be that we didn't see what was coming? This was the hubris, this was the arrogance, this was uh, this feeling that nothing could touch us. And we paid a heavy price for this. And I hope, actually I know, 
that we learn the lesson. We learn the lesson that A, we do not take anymore our uh, neighbors for granted. B, we have to be very, very ready to every possibility. Because in the Middle East, I always say that the most predictable thing is the unpredictability. Look what is going on in Syria. See what happened yesterday on the border with Lebanon. An Israeli soldier was Israeli soldier was killed by a single Lebanese army uh, soldier from the other side of the uh, Lebanese border toward Israel. If you don't exercise self restraint, if you yes, it's devastating to lose one soldier, one soul. But if you see the bigger picture and you don't let yourself to be provoked, then in the Middle East especially, nowadays, you can avoid doing great mistakes. So why I'm mentioning Syria and Lebanon? Because something like this can put the whole area in fire, on fire. So we have to be ready, we have to be not to underestimate our uh, um, players or counter players. And then God, in a way, that only four, hour, four uh, uh, years after the Yom Kippur War, which, as I said, took from us a lot. Not only people, more than 2,500 uh, soldiers were killed, but the humiliation, this dichotomy between the Hebrews and the, the fact, the, the feeling that we were defeated, even though, if you look at it militarily, we are the winners. The other day I talked to someone from Egypt, and he mentioned that, um, after all, the Yom Kippur War was a victory to Israel, uh, to, to Egypt, and it is being celebrated up in Cairo as a victory. Look at the museum which was erected especially for the Yom Kippur War. They see, uh, not without good reasons, uh, some of their successes, successes in the, in, the, in the campaign against us. It's true they managed to cross the, the Suez Canal, etc., etc. But please do not forget that at the end of the war, when a ceasefire was called and agreed upon, where were the Israeli army? 101 kilometers from Cairo. On the Golan Heights, the Israeli army was stopped almost 50 kilometers from Damascus. 40. Sorry? 40. 40. No. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> so if you take it, uh, look at it militarily, no doubt that we came out from a very devastating situation. Look, at the Golan Heights, it was like this, between the success and be between Israel being cut into half from the uh, Sea of Galilee to Haifa. Because there was nothing between the, the, the advancing Syrian army and the men of this one. It took time until we mobilized the, the army, etc., etc. All the facts are known. But what I'm trying to share with you is the fact that from the psychological point of view, we went very, very, very quickly from in a situation in which we were uh, this, uh, we had this euphoric uh, feeling to uh, very negative, bad conscience and self guilt feelings, which says, how could not, how couldn't we see? How come we were that blind? to see the positive signals. So since then, I think we learned the, the lesson. And four, de four years after the war, or less than four years, Anwar Sadat, at the beginning of 1977, at uh, his speech in the parliament, he said, among many other things, that he is ready to come to Jerusalem to talk peace with Israel. And not very long time afterwards, Menachem Begin, Menachem Begin who was portrayed in 1977 uh, uh, afterwards, uh, 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 after the, the, the big victory in the, in the campaign, as someone who will bring war, no peace, of all people, Menachem Begin immediately reached out and said, yes, you are more than welcome, Mr. President. 
And I do remember, ladies and gentlemen, that in, on the 17th of November, when Anwar Sadat landed at Ben Gurion Airport, I was in the army. But at that time, I remember I was at home. I had this very small black and white television mm -hmm. sitting in my room alone, watching history in making. Anwar Sadat coming down, I was crying. Because I thought, and I knew that this, this is the beginning of a new era. And to make a long story short, he came to Jerusalem, Anwar Sadat, and he had a speech in Jerusalem, in the Knesset. And he said in the Knesset the most, well, he criticized Israel, he said that he does not understand why Israel cannot make uh, peace, uh, he talked in favor of the Palestinians, but the bottom line was, that he was ready to talk peace with us. Not through the Americans and not through the Russians. He was talking to me personally while being in, in the Knesset. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, what make the big change. This is why, in, sp in spite of very, very many people who were a little bit suspicious of his real uh, uh, motivation of Assad, or Sadat, this was the reason why many people supported Menachem Begin by going and offering 